I've been asked to just give a uh, overview and share some insights on the treatment of cervical deformity. This is going to be sort of, I think, the polar opposite of what you guys just heard. So um, let's see here. It's my disclosures. So this is a patient that I saw some time ago, someone that you may see in the office. And, you know, um, this person, she really could not look straight ahead. How you see her there sort of staring at her toes, that, that's uh, really how she presented. And uh, her issue was really that she kept falling, falling over weeks, months. And uh, it's kind of hard to see here on this uh, image, but she actually has a brace on her left wrist because she kept falling and breaking her wrist and her arm. And uh, getting the full uh, x-rays, you can see that she's got uh, pretty significant uh, cervical kyphosis uh, and a uh, really hard time raising her head. So the question becomes, you know, what, what do we do? How do we assess these patients and what can we uh, do for them? We all know that the consequences here, they're pretty significant. So it causes a lot of neck pain, myofascial symptoms, but we really become worried about the neurological issues, right? The myelopathy, also problems with balance, walking. Start to have postural compensation, right? Hip pain, knee pain, joint pain. It becomes really debilitating for these patients. We know very well there's a lot of literature now demonstrating that the cervical alignment is very important and is associated with worse uh, pain and also health-related quality of life and outcomes for these patients. Uh, and we also know from uh, a better understanding of just local, regional, global spinal um, alignment parameters that when the cervical spine deforms, we are seeing this cascade of events. Um, I did my spine fellowship at the Cleveland Clinic, and Ed Benzel used to always say, kyphosis begets kyphosis, and this is, this is true, and especially pertinent in the cervical spine, where with the weight of the head and with the onset of kyphosis, uh, there is eventual um, a situation where horizontal gaze becomes very, very difficult. So when looking at these patients, it's very important to assess, not only to recognize the deformity, but also to think about and also uh, identify where the deformity is, cranial vertebral junction, subaxial spine, cervical thoracic, and also having understanding of what the degree of flexibility for that is, whether it's rigid, whether it moves, uh, what the patient looks like, static and uh, supine and standing. Uh, and we have to assess the regional global balance for these patients. And something that we go through with our residents and fellows is that we need to plan, plan some more, but also have to consider the morbidity of these operations and uh, potential complications with any surgical approach. So unlike, I think, the last couple talks, we're talking about ACDF, arthroplasty, uh, multiple levels. Uh, you know, as you know, the scope of these operations tend to be pretty significant, especially if uh, doing a combined and different staged approaches. Because ultimately we want this, right? This is someone who presents uh, preoperatively with a fixed kyphosis and uh, clearly looks deformed on the left side uh, and afterwards you want to get them straightened out, improve their neurology, decompress their spinal elements, but also improve their horizontal gaze so they can drive, they can do the things that they need to do in their daily lives. Uh, this is a cartoon illustration I think is really helpful. This is from one of Chris Ames's papers looking at sort of what, what it looks like when the cervical spine kyphoses and deforms and how to recognize that and the compensation you see in the rest of the spine uh, versus when the lumbar spine is the driver. And so I think the key thing to recognize is really the difference between B and C and also recognizing what the difference is when the lumbar spine is a real driver with someone with a flat back deformity like in, um, in uh, caption C and the patient is sort of, they look kyphotic, but they're jut forward, but they're really trying to hyperextend their neck to maintain horizontal gaze versus the situation in caption B where the patient's kyphotic primarily in the cervical spine and really compensating by hyperlordosing their lower back. Posterior osteotomies can be very uh, effective for these patients, and this is the cartoon illustration demonstrating that. As everyone knows here, it's really uh, an extension of the facetectomy all the way out to laterally to the soft tissue. Uh, and this is an interoperative view of what that looks like. Uh, and, uh, you know, even with the facet osteotomies, we're still able to put lateral mass screws, and sometimes if we take away too much of lateral masses, then we'll put in cervical pedicle screws. Um, but it is feasible to uh, place the hardware and instrumentation uh, in addition to the uh, osteotomies that are done. And this can be very effective uh, for these patients. 
The three column PSO uh, is much more commonly done in the lumbar spine and, uh, and is also an effective tool in the cervical spine, uh, but carries significant risk, not only because of the spinal cord, but the surrounding soft tissues and the vertebral artery and the nerve roots. It is a very powerful technique, historically been done at approximately the C7 level. Um, but uh, it can be associated with a number of problems, one being paralysis, nerve issues, nerve root dysfunction, hand weakness, vascular injury, and also you have the high potential of actually disconnecting the head and the spine from the, uh, the rest of the spine if you cut across uh, the anterior column too aggressively. So it's essentially the same idea as a lumbar spine. It's a three-column wedge resection. And, uh, you know, over the years, we've been sort of going from C7 and marching down the spine. Uh, at the MGH, uh, Tom Chan and I, we started roughly the same time and both had an interest in cervical deformity. And we really sort of started doing these together. And some of the work that I'm going to show here is really a collaboration between the two of us. So again, the challenges with this is, you know, we do these operations on the Jackson table with these patients with kyphosis, you know, their head is below that, the bar of the Jackson table, which makes it very uncomfortable and difficult for us to operate, right? Uh, Tom is like five inches taller than I am, and so by the end of the case, and we're both kyphotic, you know, I think it's, uh, it's really, really challenging. And uh, you try to do everything you can to try to maximize that, but uh, it can be very difficult to visualize. And uh, unlike the lumbar spine, where you can move around a lot of tissue and beat around the lumbar nerve roots, and the cervical spine don't really have that. Um, and so um, that, that's a challenge. The other challenge here that we've had, and I'll show an example of that, is rod failure, right? So you can get the correction, but when you have a 3.5 to 5.5 construct, and that 3-5 rod bends, eventually snaps, it's a big problem. Uh, unlike the lumbar spine where you can put in uh, larger diameter rods, heavier metals, uh, uh, it's, it's a different problem. So back to that patient, this is something, uh, kind of a construct that we do now. This lady end, ended up having a T1 PSO, uh, and you can see the, uh, the fecal sac in the midline, and there's some buckling of the dura as we anticipate. And now we double them up with uh, three five to five five connectors across a cervical thoracic junction, because that's really where the greatest stress is uh, for these patients. Um, and just to give an example, so our setup, we have the patient, we put them in Gardner-Wells tongs. Uh, this is something that uh, I learned from Dan Rue. And we put them in bivector traction on the operating table. When we did this initially, and it's something I, I mentioned, the residents and fellows, when we did this initially in our OR, uh, prior to me and Tom being there, uh, these weren't really being done. And so uh, we had a problem where the, uh, the head would bob up and down during the case because we didn't realize the anesthesiologists were moving the, uh, the weights around, you know, because they're just kind of in the way. And we, we had to make a clear point to them that you got, just don't touch the weights because it really affects the way that the head is. But uh, we found that to be very effective. And uh, this is just an intraoperative view. We published a paper uh, looking at our experience with using intraoperative navigation to help guide the osteotomies and the cuts through the bone. Uh, like I said, in the lumbar spine, you can really do a, a pretty extensive dissection, visualize that lateral vertebral body wall, see all that. But at the C7 level, T1 level, it becomes really dark. It bleeds a lot. Gravity is running downhill, blood's running down from the epidural veins, the vert is just lateral to us. And so we started using navigation, not to put screws in or anything like that, but really just to help guide how deep we are, if we're in the right trajectory, are we going to the disk space, how far are we, are we, are we going too far interior? And this is just a representation of what that looks like. There are a lot of different navigation systems out there. We have, uh, this is one of the ones that we have in Boston. It just demonstrates with the probe in multiple projections, we can see that we're down the barrel of the pedicle at C7. We can see how deep we are. We can see how much more we need to go with the drill. And now we can navigate drills and the bone scalpel, things like that. But this has really helped us become more safe and avoid spinal fluid leaks as well as nerve injury. And the goal is to close the osteotomy, right? This is the cartoon illustration showing that. And just like in the lumbar spine, you want to close that door. And uh, with the Gardner-Wells tongs, we're able to in situ contour the rods starting from the thoracic spine and then gradually elevate the head, grasping the Gardner-Wells tongs and bringing them up to the cervical screws while reducing them at the same time. Initially, we used to use the Mayfield head holder, but then one of us would have to scrub out and be under the table and it's just 
disgusting down there and we can't see what's going on and uh, you'd have to rely on a resident or fellow uh, to tell you what's going on and, and it can be a little precarious. Neuromonitoring is getting really nervous and so using the tongs that allows us to stay scrubbed in, we can manipulate the head, we see how uh, the, um, the cuts have improved the sort of elasticity of the spine uh, and lets us correct and uh, bring that to us. And so just to wrap up, we started this in 2012. This was our initial series of about 20 patients the first couple years. And you can see here we started out um, really at the C7 level um, and uh, we had a rod failure at six months, uh, in subs at a later time point, we've had three additional rod failures. Uh, we had a number of hand weakness uh, incidences as well. We had one case of paralysis. Uh, and just through the evolution of working together, developing the program, and also having more experience, started marching down the spine. So obviously, depending on where the deformity is, especially for cervical thoracic deformity, we'll, we'll do this more at T1, T2, where you have less of an issue dealing with the, the nerve root issues and the hand weakness afterwards. Obviously, the paralysis, the vascular injury is still a major issue uh, that we're concerned about, but that technique and that partnership continues to evolve. That being said, again, complications are high, right? This is from the ISSG a number of years ago, demonstrated looking at multiple institutions. And uh, similarly, you can see here that the complication rate is, you know, 40% uh, major and minor. I think if you had an ACDF or arthroplasty and told your patient that their risk of complication was 40, 46%, uh, you wouldn't be in practice that long. Uh, so it, it's, it's challenging, it's challenging situations. And so, I think as we go forward, I think it's really about optimizing the planning and using data um, to help us understand predictors for proximal distal failure uh, and to really integrate those alignment parameters and the planning from the clinic and your office into the OR because it can be very difficult to gauge where do you start, where do you stop, is the correction enough? And that's something that we struggle with and we're trying to work on and trying to how to bring those type of analytics, in, analytics into the operating room uh, to help improve outcomes. So, thank you. In terms of, you know, how do you do the monitoring, you, you know, because again, you know, back in the day, and I think, where's Jung? Jung, I mean, right? Didn't, didn't Henry used to do these awake and, and used to say, gosh, you have to do this in awake in a sitting position? Yeah. And we've all changed to that, but yeah. there's really no protocol or no accepted, you know, right. you know how, how are you doing the monitor? Obviously, you're running transcranial motors and all that, right. but what are you doing in the two minutes prior and the three minutes after your, your actual manipulation? Yeah, so basically, um, like I said, we, we've gone away from using the Mayfield just because um, uh, at least our Mayfield contraption, it has like seven knobs on it, you know, and so you literally have to get down there. You're already tired. I mean, my neck is killing me. Then you got to get down there undo the knobs and it's just so restrictive, right? And one time we actually uh, had a significant change that we lost the motors and sensories because it did all, did, undid the knobs and kind of made a, trying to be controlled, but because of the rust or something, it just jerked, right? Uh, and the motors, everything went out. They've recovered in about 20 minutes, but uh, that was, uh, that, that was a lot of fun, you know? Um, so that's why we went to the Gardner Wells tongs. And um, what we do now is obviously the tongs are underneath the sterile drape, right? But we place two non-penetrating towel clamps uh, over the drape on top of the tongs so I can, we can visually see where they are at all times. And so they're almost like two antennas sticking out from the drape, right? So if you imagine the head is down, the drape's on top, we have two penetrating, I mean non-penetrating towel clips so I can see it and I can grab it at any time. It's just showing me where the head is. And so as we're doing the osteotomies, you know, we'll do like facet osteotomies from like C5 to T2 or something. And I'll just see like how much, how much correction are we getting? You know, is it flexible, is it not? Because uh, sometimes we won't do the three column, we'll do that and then close and go to the front and maybe get a little more that way, you know? But at that time, like you said, um, we're really kind of gauging that and, um, Let's say we've done the full three column osteotomy. Uh, we won't have any rods in, um, but we'll just literally hold the tongs with one or two hands and then gradually, you know, kind of we'll ask the anesthesiologist to add a little more weight to the top vector and um, just kind of gradually move the head up and down and see where it wants to go. Uh, in neuromonitoring, we use 
really consistently, you know. So um, at our institution, our monitoring people, they don't really wait for us to ask for it. They're constantly, sometimes it's really annoying, but they're constantly asking us, like, can we check, can we, can, can we check, can we check, you know. And so now that we've done it a few times, and like I said, we've had one case of intra paralysis. We had one case of paralysis that didn't come back. I mean, they're really alert to this. So we've kind of refined our anesthetic protocol and also um, our monitoring protocol for that moment, you know, and, and there are situations where you wouldn't really anticipate it, where just a little bit of a change can produce a dramatic result, right? Because their cords are used to being bent in a certain way, and I don't know if it's a vascular issue, we keep their maps really high above 90, 100 for that duration of time. Don't give them any steroids, but we just keep the maps really high. And even through closure, we keep the maps super high because we've had cases where the signals would start to drift down as we're closing. And that's the other thing that also, you know, sometimes you're done, like the resident fellow is closing, you're thinking, I'm out of here, right? Uh, but we've actually had situations where during that period, the signals started to drop down. So we don't stop monitoring the until the patient's extubated. Right. Dave. Hey, John. Uh, I really enjoyed your talk. Um, it reminded me of some, like how some of your cases just still blow my mind. But um, I was curious mainly how like you decide to do like a double rod construct or if you use like alternative metal alloys, like do you decide most of that pre-op or do you decide some of that intra-op depending on what kind of construct you're uh, You know, we did, before it was we just did uh, three five to five five titanium rods, but to be fair, uh, you know, as everyone knows, you can take that rod and bend it like this very easily, you know, in the OR. And, you know, these patients, are they're used to... Um, being flexed forward. And so there's a lot of neuromuscular memory that's pushed, driving them forward. So we've seen patients bend rods and also fracture rods, even with cobalt chrome. And so that's why uh, we just double them up with uh, the side-to-side -side connectors. Um, some vendors don't have that, you know, so I think that's, if you're going to do that, you have to make sure that who you're going to use has that ability to link up, like, from 3.5 to 5.5, or whatever, you know, larger diameter it is, you know, so. Um, but we, tr we do that preemptively now. Has the, has the double rod helped? Do you find that the double rod is better than the cobalt? Uh, yeah, it's, pre it's prevented. Uh, we haven't had any fractures that way. We have not had any significant variances in the SVA. So one thing that I noticed, right, early on, so I started my career at MGH in, like, September of 2011, right? And Tom, October 2011. So we started doing these and you're getting x-rays, you're going to meetings, you're seeing everyone's great x-rays and you're wondering like, how come mine don't look like that? Because <laughs> like at four weeks, you know, like really, you go to a meeting, everyone's like, these, these show all the parameters, they look awesome. And then in reality, it, it never works that way, right? So we'll get x-rays on the table, x-rays before they go home, x-rays at six weeks, x-rays at three months. And that x-ray when they're in the hospital to what at six weeks, they're dramatically different because their SVA has already started to pitch forwards, right? So you're in the OR and you measure it and it looks like, oh, it's within four, like high five, everyone's slapping each other on the ass, right? And everyone's really happy. But, but then you look at them six weeks later and they're like, not double that, but you see there's a real difference. And so that's why we try to change up, you know, the type of rod construct and, we're also wary of, is that going to lead to more distal failures because it's just more metal? You know, I haven't seen that, but that's a consideration. We're going to have to move on, but one, one yeah. quick question. Uh, yes, uh, it's a great talk. So uh, I'm Yoon from Seoul, and uh, I did a research together with Justin Smith a couple of years ago mm. about uh, uh, how surgeons treat differently in each type of uh, subcal deformity patients. It's a kind of questionnaire type. Uh, I mean, survey, right. but uh, there's no agreement. Uh, I don't see any statistical I mean, conclusion from the, uh, uh, that result. So uh, in your uh, presentation, you show us uh, so many cases of C71 PSO. So yeah. I just only have a, t a couple of uh, PSO cases. So uh, usually my PSO in C71 is the the apex of the uh, cervical deformity kyphosis is just localized in the lower cervical or uh, high thoracic area. So uh, first is the, what is your indication of a C7 or T1 PSO? Second one is the, uh, when you correct the uh, alignment during the operation, or what is your uh, radiological parameter to uh, adjust your uh, sagittal uh, 
alignment during interoperatively? Yeah, so interoperatively, we just yeah. want to try to maintain, we want to try to get that C2 to C7 SVA mm -hmm. as close to um, a pre-planned target. It may be, you know, four, maybe four in a normal person, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. if it's really dramatic, you know, everyone varies a little bit, so we'll decide on a parameter and we'll try to get to that. Um, in terms of which level, I agree with you. I think for subaxial cervical deformity, uh, we're not going to do the PSOs mm -hmm. mostly. It's going to be posterior, anterior, posterior, or combined anterior, posterior. But it's really when the apex of the kyphosis, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's really at the cervical thoracic junction, so mm -hmm. at the C7, somewhere between C7 to T2. Mm -hmm. uh, that's typically what we'll do the three column osteotomy. But you're right, it's. We don't do it as much now, um, utilizing more combined posterior and anterior approaches. Yeah.